It's lovely to get, really lovely to get this opportunity to, to have a conversation with a whole family about learning uh, and education. So I, I really would like to welcome Bing and Alex and Roland uh, and, and uh, thank you for inviting me into the conversation because I was really interested to, uh, and, and enjoy seeing how you're all relating to each other and you're, 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 you're all thinkers. Tell me what that means, what, what learning in your relationships means, you know, what, are you, are you teaching each other? I, I suppose we are because, um, you know, me being the youngest, I know things that they don't know, you know, you know, keeping up with what's going on in the world, you know, you know, in terms of like culturally or even politically. Um, and then they teach me about, you know, back in their day when they were young, <laughs> And how, you know, how they were, you know, how they were going on in their life and then how they were, you know, acting during their education and then how they view the world, how, what they did to, you know, be able to reach up to this certain point and how they were able to, you know, teach me how to be a better me, but at the same time, still be me at the same time. You know, it's like that kind of balance. Well, I think... Uh... This is probably the description from her perspective with the current situation. So if we were to look back how we started this whole communication and also um, how we supported her learning and development over the time, it wasn't always like this. And uh, uh, we keep saying, and at times we keep reflecting, say we were learning as well as parents. This is actually one of the things uh, many parents tend to uh, ignore because no one was an expert in parenting to begin with. We were parented and then we learn some past experience of our parents and try to adopt it or adapt it to raising our own children. But then there's also different levels of development and supporting. So, you know, from the early time, one child is too young to have this kind of proper conversation or really influenced the cognitive development. It was all about the physical safety and also, you know, the survival, you know, providing enough food, shelter and clothes and entertainment. So, you know, try to make them happy. And then over a certain development age, like when, you know, any individual grow biologically, they start develop different parts of their body. So this is the time when she's entering the teenager, you know, kind of early adulthood and late teen is where the cognitive development comes most important. And that is also where, in our view, shaping her overall behaviors. So I think I, I probably wouldn't call myself a good parent all the time. I was quite lousy as a mother mm -hmm. at young time, in, the, in her young age, and uh, the support that she grew up quite healthily was attributed to my parents caring because they were carrying me quite well and then they lended their extension, uh, extended support to their granddaughter. And that, in a way, I felt safe to, help, to put my daughter into their caring hand. And they built the basic level of behaviors. And then uh, Alex has always been known uh, seen as a behaving little girl <laughs> and uh, we keep you know one of the things in a joking way is she never give us the excuse to punish her or to tell her off because i'm usually right <laughs> 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 for for the kind of misbehavior you know like usually when we go out seeing children misbehaving in public we always reflect we have never had to deal <laughs> with that kind of behavior with her and in turn, we felt, well, we're missing this part. And, uh, and then the, the other thing we did uh, emphasize, although we don't know how to really give more specific support, one thing we were quite specific in the early time of teaching her is be honest. Mm -hmm. She would receive more reprimand for lying about trivial things than making some mistakes. It's and, true. and this actually shaped her, uh, you know, the behavior and also probably the, the basic level of ethical judgment that she knows under no circumstances, she should, she can lie about it. 
and then she can lie to us or lie to anybody else. If it's very serious, no chance of lying. But if I can like sneak in a lie, like, well, yeah, you know, we can't tell what is you know genuine, what is yeah, not. But not you, but other people. I know it's fun. <laughs> that is you just being, you know, quite smarty. No, it's and fun. It's because like. I'm saying something, and to me, it makes sense. You know, it's pretty obvious. They don't get it. So I'm like, oh, well, but, uh, so I'm like, I throw in a, in a really bad joke in there, and then I twist the facts, and they don't realize it. And I'm like, I'm lying. And they go, you are? I'm like, yeah. And then they say, you're a really good liar. I was like, ooh. Well, that really depends on how we interpret it depends that. on the one who is receiving. Yeah. But picking up from what Alex said is the child comes up with the what question. What is going on in the world? Or this is or observing. This is what's going on in the world. And in, in my opinion, it is the parent's duty to explain, well, this is why this is happening in the world. So there was, there was one thing, and I, and I think it, it fits what Alex said, is uh, we were in a toy store once when she was very very little i probably don't remember <laughs> and she wanted a toy and i said alex i don't have the money and alex looked at me that serious that you have a card <laughs> so i had to explain to her you have to put money in the card or you can't use the card oh so these these connections obviously when, when you are a child and compared to even more mature people, being and I, are also children. So the perspective and the ability changes with your age. And I think it is, like I said, the duty of the older generation to share this experience and to explain, well, what is going on in the world to those who do not have that experience. And in case of Alex, it has been received very well. And she reflects on these things. I'm picking up uh, humor. Humor is very much in my <laughs> part of your relationship, and also sarcasm. We love a good. We love being sarcastic. So what, what's the importance of humor in your relationship? Then? I don't know. I think it's just something we do naturally. It's just like if I can make a joke, like a really bad joke, then they'll still laugh at me, but they'd be like, "It's not funny," and then they would joke about that for not being me in the front. Me being not funny, and they would joke about that. One, one thing that I keep referencing to Bing is a, a scene from a TV show when Sheldon Cooper's friends introduce him to his girl, to his future girlfriend, and they realize, oh my God, what have we done? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and sometimes when Alex is talking to us, I recognize so much of Bing and myself that I'm saying, what have we done to let this child loose on the world? <laughs> Being her age, but with the maturity, the of, maturity a 40 of a 40-year-old. Man. <laughs> yeah. We're very specific in that. I, I think like th this is actually, that, that is why it's quite good to have this kind of conversation. Like when you find humor is so, uh, you know, highlighted among our conversation, And if we're really reflecting on why, uh, like Alex said, it just naturally happened. I think in a way, um, first of all, for the child to be able to respond to <coughs> us humorously or, you know, accepting the humor side is we do not forbid her to speak up. And that is one of the things we tend to do is I, I try to avoid throughout my conversation with her, despite of her age, is I don't tell her what to do, what not to do. Even if she's doing something that I'm not entirely happy, I accept that is her choice. And what I tend to do or what I tried my best to do is to tell her my opinion openly, honestly, and then share with her my view and hence what in my view could happen if you continue doing this and give her at least the different perspectives And then it is left with her to decide whether or not this sort of behavior is worth pursuing or put into a stop. Or at least, even if sometimes the behavior is not immediately altered, 
she will be conscious of that. She will be thinking, and then she will probably be observing herself until one day she comes to a conclusion that either she accepts it or she modifies it. Yeah. So, so this is really um, one thing、um, because honesty is a very big principle exercising in our family. We always tell her, "You tell us anything that happens, good and bad," and.、Uh, We do not what、well, we we judge, but we don't judge just by exercising parents' authority. We have never done that. One of the things we always do is, if we say Alex, you don't do that, we explain why. So yes, there are behaviors that require us to be assertive in forbid, as in you know you don't throw food. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't just leave your food halfway finished. You have to clean your bowl and then. Uh, and then you don't throw your rubbish around. So those are the hardcore behaviors. The simple right or wrong. Then you do the right thing. But comes to perceiving what is going on outside. This is where we want to help her to cultivate her own view and shape her, and then sharing our view to let her, you know, to give her different references, and also. Because、uh, the conversation or the communication between、uh, Roland and me, we are very you know reflect、uh, re- relaxed, reflective, and、uh, kind of humor humorous most of the time. And she picks up and she joins. And when she realizes we are not stopping her, we actually、uh, feel you know welcoming her participation. You're encouraging me. Okay, we encourage you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's that's exact. That is exactly the point. You cannot raise a child without any boundaries、mm-hmm. in terms of do whatever you want. You also can't raise a child with within very strict confines all the time. So the balance between those two and nurturing that the child develops herself and her own view, and then looks at it. Well, my parents actually do make sense, or in this case, they don't make sense. So how can how can I? Understand why, or maybe change their approach to something. So, I, th- I think even as a very young child, when she was four or five, six years old, she had a lot of freedom on a lot of things. <laughs> and other, on other hands, I have to, I have to say,、uh, especially concerning her safety, I was very much overprotecting her. If we're talking And, about traditional roles, that's the mother. That's the father. <laughs> so, it's, it, it it is just when I to, to, to say what being what being said, we became parents. We did not fall on on the face of the earth being parents,、mm-hmm. and in a family situation that I came into, be being who I am, duty responsibility. And realizing, well, this is not this is not only my responsibility to be a husband for being a boyfriend, a husband for being. This is also my responsibility. I have to be a father. I have to be not only a father, but a guide, a friend, and so many other roles. And it it, it is in part the result of being overwhelmed with all these roles that I say, okay, she needs that kind of freedom because I have no idea what to do here in in this area. And I think parents also need to acknowledge that there is a part in the child's development that they have absolutely zero control over, and that their time, where they can shape this human being that is their child, is very limited. So, what 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 do you want your child to be? And for me, this was this is a human being. I never treated her as、uh, an irresponsible baby. I very often,、uh, mostly, treated her as as an adult, as an equal. And I said, okay, if you do that, this is what's likely to happen. This is the kind of behavior that I find positive. This is the kind of behavior I find negative. So and. Overall, I think this has worked out pretty well. Like, like being said, there was never a time, and I, ha- I have to say, I don't think we appreciated that to the to the degree that we should. There was never a time where I said, "God, if if 
my child was doing that because my child would never do that. So, yeah. No, it's usually two factors. I don't want to, don't, I don't have the energy to, or I knew, I know this is wrong and I will get punished for it. So I'm just like, <laughs> like when um, in school, there was like times where they would like to like, you know, skive school, like skive their classes. And then I remember this one time where my friend, um, she, she would used to do that by, you know, going to the bathroom, in quotations, and then she wanted me to come with her once. And then my initial response was, why? Why are we going to the bathroom? I don't need to pee. I'm fine just sitting here and going on my iPad, not really doing the work, but I'm still here. And when we sh somehow she convinced me. And then I was like, should we make like a cover story just in case so we don't get in trouble saying like, oh, I, one of us had to do this and I had to do the other thing. And they were like, no, 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 we're just going. I was like, you know this is class time, right? She goes, yeah, and I go, okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I came back, I was just like, this is an experience. I don't really like it because, you know, like, it, cause, okay, the class was boring. I wasn't really doing anything in the class. I was just like there. It was um, creative thinking. Mm -hmm. I was just there. <laughs> and then, um, but I still did my work, even though I was like, it was not really interested at all because by the third weekend I was like this is a waste of my time <laughs> but I don't want to do math so I was like might as well just do this mm -hmm. yeah so it's just like making the idea of I in, for me I understand what is right and wrong but you know as a teenager I would like to experience the wrong just to see what would happen and then when I know what happens Later on, I can make that decision. Well, I know the consequences. I know what happened. So when I'm like in my advanced tires, I have like free periods to study. And sometimes I don't study most of the time because, you know, like after prelims or big tests, your, your brain's just like nothing. And I have the opportunity. I still I do have work to do, but it is my choice not to do the work. And I will pay for that choice, whether or not. That means missing the deadline or not doing as well. And I know that from next time, do the work and then I can rest later that kind of. So, so you share these experiences readily with your parents mm -hmm. and uh, you, you feel uh, free to make your decisions well, and have a conversation? Is that what this I'm is a highly <laughs> philosophical debate, the idea of free will. Do we actually have yeah. any? But when it comes to decision making, I feel like I, in a way, I do. But at the same time, there is still like, you know, like when a river, it's like when you shape a path, the river will go down one way. But if it's shaped another way, the water will freely just go down that way. So it's like for me, I'm like the water and my parents are like the land on either side, controlling, making sure I don't go too fast or go, go into the wrong direction and flooding people and killing them all. That would be, but, um, <laughs> Quite is a metaphor. I love metaphors. <laughs> well, I, I don't, yeah, I think we, we, well, when she was little, probably we both had moments were overreacting to some silly things she did. But more and more, um, when she's becoming older, we actually, uh, at least we don't object to that idea and now we don't forbid or force her not to so we certainly wouldn't jump to shouting at her or you know uh, blame her for doing that what is more interesting to me is always finding out why and then once i know the why i can then make a more you know fair <laughs> comment and then maybe give the suggestions at least she would accept and especially um as a teenager one there are a lot of development will cause sort of confusion of themselves. The one thing I know is don't push them to the other side. So when we overly force them to do things or not to do things, it actually creates the counter effect. Math. And I don't see, yeah, and I don't see why. And also um, that will lose their chance to really experience. So I'm always the one who encourage her to experience things, even if that means it might just be a fail, you know, in the end. It doesn't matter. She will always learn something. So I think 
um, the the kind of situation I always remember quite nicely when she when we were in China, she was uh, at this international school. Yes, the homework were in the Chinese way, quite a lot. And then usually is you do it tonight and hand in tomorrow. That is quite often the case. And there was one night uh, she was, I think, in her 12 or 13 years old. She actually just like halfway jokingly, but halfway seriously telling me, oh, I really don't want to do homework. Can I not do it? <laughs> so I actually said, of course, you don't have to do it. As long as you are okay, not submitting your work the next day and then face the punishment, standing in the corner or whatever the teacher tell you to do as a you know penalty, I don't mind. And uh, after that response, it took her a moment. I said, okay, I will do it. <laughs> so I, I mostly give the choices to her it, to the point that she, there were times that she got really frustrated because I always say it is your choice. And I'm not interviewing. It annoys, I should annoys find- me. It annoys me <laughs> to my brain. <laughs> like when it comes to it, like a very important decision, like what color should I make my character's hair? She goes, it's up to you. And I go, I'm asking you because I want your opinion. And you say, it's up to you. It doesn't really help me. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't help me what color they are. Or no. it doesn't bother me what color they are. Well, Okay, not in the video game sense, but in general, like, I'm asking you because I know you know, and I want your opinion, but you don't give it to me, so I'm like, thank you for nothing. <laughs> well, that is the experience you have to have. You know, I had that moment as well, and I have to find out my choice. Yes, it was agonizing, but that is how you learn, so I'm creating the learning opportunity for you. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. You, you, you spoke about uh, equality in a relationship, and you, you, there is, there is no such thing. There is no such thing <laughs> in, a, in a relationship. E- equality, <laughs> equity. What is that? There is no what such is, thing. Well, it's it's seeing seeing somebody else uh, in any mutual way. I know this is so, mutual. Yeah, you smack yeah, me, I, I smack you. This, that is yeah. equality. <laughs> No, she she hasn't she hasn't really done. How how do, how do I say that? Life altering. For decisions. the, she hasn't made two bad choices, and in terms in terms of uh, she she knows what she wants to do with with her life, which is already an advantage she has over many many people, the uh, the same age as her or even older. And I simply left it at okay. These are the things you need to do. These are the things you need to achieve. The fewer of the things that you need to do, you do and do them properly. The smaller does the chance get that you get at the end what you want to achieve. And about about this equality, there is there is no such thing as as an equality or equity in a relationship. It is not a fifty. It is not a fifty fifty between me and being to educate the child. Maybe, maybe you, I can qualify how I've come to use that that mm-hmm. term so like like we're all enjoying conversation the, the we're we're <clears throat> actively producing the or or coming together in the equity so people one, one individual might talk and there's an equity in listening so it, it's maybe changes but i i think you know uh, conversation and listening go together and in that, I, I guess yeah. I see a, a mutuality and a yeah. uh, an equity. Yeah. With without that equity, what we see. Uh, no, in that in that in that sense, in that, in that <laughs> yeah. sense, and what what I was what, what what I mean by there is there is no such thing is if Bing and I don't give our one hundred percent for this relationship and raising the child, and the child doesn't give a hundred percent of herself into. Well, being raised, it, I know it's, it's, it's uh, m- maybe not the right words in, the, in this context, but if people don't work together, as you said, the result will be less than 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, equity in terms of like we are all on the same level of ground. So we don't exercise parents' authority over her. And equally, she doesn't have to abuse her being a minor at home to get to what she wants. I want to, I try, but it doesn't she, work. Well, she does try, of course, as a kid, and then we allow that. 
And the other thing is well, also. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> well, the other thing is like um, this is really about we encourage her to explore who she really is, and this is something I can never answer. Neither can Roland, but okay, only can know. only she can answer. I can't answer. But she will continually continuously explore, <laughs> or she will learn more and more means of how to explore. That is us giving her the you know the suitable approach or the tools, and then also at the same time we give her a very uh a very much a safety net. So in other way, she can go out trial and error, but she doesn't have to uh feel she's out left alone facing all those bad consequences. There will always be someone supporting her at the at the background, but many times doing things she has to do that. Put herself forward, especially that concerns her own development. But they will always be us at the background, uh, supporting her, uh, assuring her, and even helping her within reasonable limit. So she doesn't have to feel that she's completely fighting her own battle. And that is now what we feel as parents should be doing with her entering the adulthood fairly soon. Starting a brand new chapter of her life, facing even more opportunities, but at the same time chaos, and that is definitely not the time we should fight her battle in front of her, cutting all those branches, the spikes, so there is a smooth road. You go ahead. No, we have to instead preparing us mentally that there will be probably higher risk she will encounter. So instead of telling her "Don't do this, don't do that," we will say, "Okay, what you need to be careful if you have to do that." So I think like the conversation I actually had quite recently is, you will have to go to nightclub with your classmates because she will have more social life. <laughs> yeah, you know, as an adult, and、uh, at this moment she's quite despised the idea of going to nightclub, saying there's no point. And I actually said to her, "Well, don't have to try to dismiss that experience." But you do need to be careful how to protect yourself. So, and then you know, we trust you. You don't have to. You know, we trust you not to do things stupid, not to do things deliberately, put yourself in danger, and certainly not doing things when you are not hundred percent comfortable. And then knowing how to seek help when an emergent situation happens. And then how to you know contact the right people or ask for help or even just. Withdraw from seemingly dangerous situation. Yeah, because you know she's more and more going out to meet her friends during the day, and sometimes even you know having dinner together, everything. And、uh, it comes to that we have we don't have a restrictive time. Well, for me at least, I I don't say oh you have to come home by whatever whatever the time. I usually mutually discuss with her. Like what time do you want to come? Yeah, like I always like when I'm at my friend's house and it's like in the afternoon. I send her texts like, "What time do you want me home?" And I was like, "Well, we're having dinner at this time." You、yeah. decide, and I was like, "Okay, I'll check the bus time," and and I just let my mother know like this is when I'm coming home, and if I'm if my bus is delayed, I'll also let you know. Like <laughs> when I go to school, when I get on the bus, I text them and I'm like, "Bus," they're like, "They know I'm on bus," and then when I'm when I'm at school, I'm like, "Here." <laughs> So、very, very economical with the words, but she, <laughs> but she does share. Well, this, this is, this is where I am, and lets us know that she is safe. And because we actually do that to each other, so it's not just doing to Alex. Even between us, when we are out, we always inform each other whereabouts. So this is the common. So that is probably what you can refer as equity. Like you know, this is the relationship equity that we. Keep each other informed of what we do, and then that is in a way to assure each other that we are all okay, and also、uh, presenting this、uh, kind of situation that we don't have to worry that we are not informed in time if something happens. So they will always tell us what's going on. There is always a record. Drink your tea; it's disgusting. <laughs> So it so so this is how、um, we re well probably not saying raising her we are growing up with her, and so when I start this kind of conversation to give her safety 
training or safety、uh, information, I suddenly realized, oh, she's growing up. We have to <laughs> adjust ourselves to be with her. We can't use the previous approach continuously to talk to her, to communicate with her, or to support her. So we need to adjusting ourselves. So this is a growing phase. So as a parent, we can't use the same approach throughout her life because she changes every minute, every second.、Mm. Then so should we. Survival、is. of the fittest, being able to adapt into your environment. If you don't, you're dead. <laughs> Not well, literally. Well, I'm very, very interested in in looking at these、uh, or paying more attention to these familial、uh, and kinship relations, because uh, I uh, my suspicion is. Uh, that what we need to learn to have a more、uh, I, I, a better world in terms of human culture, we we learn from the relationships that、exactly. we're most proximal to. Exactly, one hundred percent agree with you there. And the the、uh, he, hearing. Hearing how you're relating to each other, are you familiar with、uh, Carl Rogers' work? The name does ring a bell.、Yeah. If if it's written with a C, Carl Rogers. Yes. Yes. The the name does ring a bell. But if you would ask me,、uh, what what did he say? What he wrote? Uh, uh, maybe it's in the back of my head. But the the name is actually familiar. Yes. I got very interested in Julian Edge、uh, Julian Edge's work. And his work on cooperative development, and he introduced me to the the dynamic which Carl Rogers worked with, and it's very, very reciprocal. It's、uh, listening to each other, it's repeating back what you've just heard and learned from the other person to double check the other person's perspective. You know, there's there's a lovely equity in that, and when I compare that to、um, A different perspective. D. F. Skinner's. You're familiar with behaviorism,、mm -hmm. <laughs> which is which seems to be so mechanically、um, um, agenda driven.、Uh, right, an, an individual is then thinking about、uh, punishing behavior you don't want <laughs> and rewarding behavior you do want. And I, I remember when I was asked, "Well, what alternative is there to behaviorism?" Yeah, yeah. And there's a wonderful book called "Punished Through Rewards." And, and、oh, is, what, is... what I'm hearing in in your family <laughs> dynamic, which is filled with laughter, conversation, and dialogue, is that there isn't this behaviorism. It's well. It's to 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 really pick up on that because this is this is a this is a direction that I have looked at over the last couple of of weeks and months in 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 a different context, but、uh, is essentially、um, if you take a step back and look at this stick and carrot approach, that because that's what it is. <laughs> what we can see if we fairly observe it, the stick does not work, and neither does the carrot. So at some point,、um, now that this is this is ages ago, where where I, where I actually taught this, is if you give someone if you give someone a reward for a behavior, the person will repeat that behavior, but the reward needs to increase because it's no longer enticing. The other thing is to quote one of my、uh, one or one of the people that taught me how to teach is, yes, you can one hundred percent. Beat knowledge into people. The problem is, if you put the boot on people's neck, you can't take that boot off. And、uh, similar to the reward, the repercussions have to get more and more and 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 harder to generate the same compliance as before. Because if the boot once the boot goes off the neck, you will have a revolution at your hand. That it it doesn't depend. It doesn't matter at what stage you stand, whether you、uh, say from a political Uh, stance or from an educational stance, so yeah, the motivation part actually,、uh, what you you know、yeah. that that one actually picked up is、uh, 
Daniel Pink actually talked about, you know, how to motivate people, and then he did that very simple experiment, you know, and then the the kind of conclusion yes is referring to workplace motivation. So basically, this kind of simple rewarding motivation, just like the monetary reward or something, can only work on people carrying out simple tasks. When it comes to complicated tasks, this simple monetary driven rewarding will become demotivating and actually is dysfunctioning. And uh, I think from one perspective, also the other thing, like one of the recent uh, expressions I just learned or uh, got me thinking uh, is this concept of givers and takers. So if we use the punishment and reward way to educate our children, it will create one side Either parents or or children are givers, while the other side naturally the takers. So for the taker side, they can then continue to think they are entitled to all kinds of special treatment, including the reward, including the recognition, and it become like just take it for granted. A formal transaction. Yeah, is that truly a transactional relationship? Well, the givers will just feel they have constantly, uh, they have to constantly sacrifice, provide sufficient support, not only sufficient but also in more variety at incre- you know, incremental value, until they are exhausted from this kind of relationship and then become withdrawn, willingly or unwillingly, at very high cost. So, from this perspective. If punish and reward relationship occurs at the early time of this parenting situation, then we are facing the future generations or the future workforce entering the economic activity are either givers or takers, not both. And then, in a way, while there's not, you know, systematically <coughs> proven evidence, I think the information and the news or the situation has happened around the world has pointed to us those people who claim they are the social justice warriors trying to protect certain groups' value or trying to represent them fairly <coughs> among the society or among the topic, they are probably the <coughs> givers, uh, the, the takers. They feel like they are disadvantaged for what, whatever the reason in the early time, or they are also the life experience, and they want to claim that rights continuously, and more so, they want to uh, receive more support and only the agreement. And if anybody refuses to agree with that, regardless how reasoning that can, how reasonable they can be, they will just simply dismiss that. While the givers just feel more and more obliged to satisfy the takers. To the point of, be, of being drained. Yeah, and to the point they start feeling they got no choice. And then they have to feed into this kind of fallacy. So those takers will be happy. But would they ever be happy? And would they ever, <laughs> you know, and then also what is the value to the whole society? What is the value of what is given yeah. with, without effort? And uh, moreover, what, what you are... Uh, what you are pointing at, when when comes the point of crossover when the givers are no longer happy with the situation of being drained? Yeah, and again, again uh, you create the society in the family, as as, as you were, were were pointing out earlier on, and there was again one one example when she was very very little. We bought bag of crisps with six small bags in it. So, and as a child, well, I like crisps. I eat all six bags. So, okay. So there will be no crisps for a while. So there is there is a certain amount of crisps that we can afford. There's a certain kind of bad food amount that we let, let people have, but only up to a certain point. And this giving and taking, yeah, this this is this is something where you know okay I have to budget my money I have to budget I have this amount of this kind of food 
And on the other hand, there are so many occasions when, uh, and there is photographic evidence. Uh, no, no, there's no evidence. Yes, there is no. photographic evidence no. where, for example, a chocolate cake that I happened to order accidentally ended up in the child. You know, you accidentally ordered it, I accidentally ate it. Yeah, and <laughs> a, a venison steak accidentally ended up in the child. <laughs> And but you see this this is this is exactly the point I'm making. The second venison steak was not like oh I'm I'm still sitting here yeah there's another venison steak so I said, no Alex that second venison steak is what I'm having. <laughs> so there is there is I, th I think also what we said between strict boundaries and completely hands off there is a narrow path and there is no right or wrong so. In, in that sense, you, you could say parents are making it up as they go. Yeah. But we, we, we can judge, we can judge the result. And again, I'm pretty happy with, with the result. Although, although I'm saying, Oh my God, what have I done? That this is literally a mini version of, of me and B. I always say, if you have a complaint, talk to the manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think like one of the things, uh, probably, what I try not to do is I don't want her to become someone <clears throat> or to do something. It's like I don't have that clear idea. I'm exploring along her life. We look at it together and then we celebrate it together and then we reflect, we, we re reflect on failures together and then to make the next improvement. So I don't have a clear goal like many very ambitious parents Oh, my child will be a lawyer when she grows up. Oh, my child will be, a, you know, a very famous singer or a musician. Well, no, I think my child will be someone who is competent enough. Well, if I have to answer that question, what would you like your child to become when she is fully in adulthood? Probably I would say, well, I want my child to live a life that's <coughs> that is fulfilling, meaningful, and she is capable of handling that situation while sustaining herself. However, she does that. I'm happy. And mm. that is also, yeah, the status. The, so this is also when I even do the student coaching. When students many times asking for career advice from me, I always asking them to describe what would be your ideal life status <laughs> in five years time or 10 years time. And then you can start thinking about what you can do. You can also see to how they that engage stage. with that question. Yeah, and then how to engage that it also shows what kind of you know the the self efficacy level as well as the the awareness of themselves and awareness of their surroundings are. And so in another way is I can't I can't criticize and I don't want to criticize other parents how they educate their children. All I can say to them is, whatever you do, you have to, you know, there is a consequence following. And uh, the, the only thing is, do not dismiss any outcomes of your own action. Accept whatever comes and don't blame your child. Competence and happiness. Yeah, yeah. yeah so very like utilitarian kind of, the consequence. Consequent Consequentialism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't say that word. Say it again. Conche Conse <laughs> Consequentialism. Consequentialism. You know, like... Oh my God, I know. I actually enjoy, you know, learning about, you know, like how people, some people, um, you know, go about their lives. And you know, when it comes to making moral decisions, or like we look at the consequences of our actions. But when I think about that, I'm like, you can't really know what the con the consequence of your actions are going to be. So I always find that's a bit of an iffy way to go about life. But then the idea of, you know, the John Stuart Mill kind of approach, the greatest happiness principle, you know, maximizing uh, pleasure for the majority. You have to, at some point in your life, you have to focus on you. And in this world, you could say, making sure that you are happy in this world and then making sure other people are happy. So you need to focus on you, and then you can do it's others. also because you can't control other people, but only yourself. Yeah, that's true. So you can be accountable for yourself. Yeah, for the mini philosopher in the making. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just a joy that the philosophy is still being 
disgusts and, and is is a living thing. I mean, the the conversations that people have, they, I, I've been come, become so interested in what happens in the informal spaces, uh, because what what you find uh, in, in maybe stereotype, stereotype representations, oh, philosophy, that's that's spoken about people in dusty rooms in. In universities with, and stuff like, like that. Like a nice leather couch, a cigar, and a nice whiskey. That's what we think of <laughs> philosophy. Which doesn't sound too bad. But to have things just open for conversation, uh, I mean, it speaks of a playground. And I'm, I'm quite interested to hear where play features in how you're learning and how you're sharing what you've learned. Uh, I think a good example of that is Lego. I love Lego. Yeah. I don't know if it in like inter interlinks, but I think in terms of play, I think Lego is like a good toy for you know all <laughs> children to play with because you understand how you know like you know you follow instructions, but you also have that kind of freedom with the building blocks. I love Lego. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. I have a lot of Lego. That if I sold them, I'd probably be a millionaire, <laughs> but I won't sell them. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's it's funny that you uh, it's funny that you mentioned that when I look at uh, how how we brought up Alex, I, the the first presents that uh, or stuff that we bought her miniature. No, no, not that was not the first. The first thing that uh, I bought her when uh, I, I entered her life in two thousand and ten is a teddy bear. Oh, teddy. And the next thing that I bought her were the old style Tom and Jerry cartoons. Oh uh, no, I love them. I love the old classic Tom and Jerry stuff because it has you know so much nostalgia and then the music in there. It's like if you want your child to appreciate <clears throat> good music, put it in the car too. Then they will enjoy it. Because if you you know like if you force them to enjoy it, they'd be like, what kind of crap is this? You know, like And you the third the third present was a wooden toy that that trains it. Yeah. Oh, the train tracks. Tracks. yeah. So and when, when when you see these these are the kind of toys that relate much more to a classical education instead of buying some cheap crap. So I mean I try, I tried to introduce her to uh, my hobby and but after a while she she found okay that's not for me. Yeah. So as so pa painting small miniatures for example, I relax over it. Bing gets very aggressive over it. <laughs> yeah. So th this is this is how how people are different. But when it when it comes back to the the classic stuff, yeah, the the simple things. And again, people do not uh, when you when you go further about educations, people do not fail at the very high level. People fail because they didn't do one thing in the foundation right. It's you. It's usually, and I I turned uh, turned out to be the for the one of a nail school, so that that famous that famous poem that for because the a nail was missing, the kingdom was lost. So small things have big consequences in both on both sides. So, well, looking at you know how we really just you know join this playing part. I think when she was younger, the toys we introduce to her, we also play along with her, as in we participate in it. And then I generally had curiosity towards that. And I think Lego, yeah, as she rightfully said, mm -hmm. uh, Lego actually got me playing more with her because I enjoy building the Lego while I don't enjoy painting the little no, miniatures. I can't either. I think I don't have enough patience. <laughs> yeah. And so that is the part that we often work together and building different sides and then become, you know, choose more and more complicated buildings. And another part, uh, things is also we watch, we would watch cartoons together with her. So it's like, you know, Tom and Jerry and Looney Tunes equally, we enjoy them as, you know, Little little children. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. yeah so again, so, old, very old school, old style stuff. Yeah, and then like the old Batman animation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love it. When um the Netflix Netflix actually um 
released like the old Batman animated shows on Netflix. And then the minute I saw that, I was like, oh my God, this is my childhood in like on the big <laughs> screen in high resolution. I, I have to say, no, this is not a 40 year, 40 <laughs> year old that's speaking about all oh, my childhood, like, like myself. This, this, this is 17 year 17 old. Year old. And yeah. I, I always say to my friend, and I always say to like, when I meet people and I go, you know, these children these days, you know, there was nothing like what I was. You know, when they were 13, they you know they're doing TikTok dances. When I was 13, I was building Lego and listening to, um, you know, like pop music and um, getting into Minecraft, you know, that kind of thing. I didn't even know what a phone was properly when I was like, well, well, 13, yeah, and I was like, I have no idea. I always see what my parents had. And then I was thought of the phone as, you know, as this, you know, communications device. And I was like, fair enough. And then when I got my own phone, I was like, oh my God, I can do everything on this thing. <coughs> Hold up, I'm so sorry. I'm just dying here. I'm fine. And then the, the other thing is also um, the, the, the other side of play is, you know, reading bedtime stories. So we had a lot of, you know, the children's stories <laughs> and like the mm-hmm. Miss, uh, Miss and... Miss Naughty, Miss, Mr. Grumpy, oh, the, yeah, you know, the, the little the Mr. Man, yeah, yeah, Mr. Man, yeah, and, and yeah, and now we also have the very classic ones like the the dinosaur one, no, the Gruffalo, oh, yeah, yeah, the Gruffalo, yeah, and then uh, so to extend that, we also you know uh, there were a couple pantomime we took her, so at like the early age, those are really you know letting her try different things, and if she's not interested probably just one time try at least she she's been there yeah and the other thing is that that is also a time you know we will when we don't have any other place to go go to the museum Mm -hmm. and she forever enjoys those uh activity you know you can touch and feel to do the little my favorite game they still have it is the one with the wolves ecology yeah i love that game (laughs) yeah so you design yeah your wolf pack and then how that ecology can be maintained so so she will do that and uh, also the animal side, you know, those, yeah, the natural side and then the space. So there's uh, several fixed areas. As soon as, as long as we go to the museum, she will demand we go there. You can, you can, you can yeah. plan your visit. You know what's going to happen. Yeah. And then like the dinosaur area that you can do the archaeology, I like love finding that. dinosaurs. I, I saw that they got rid of it and I was like, yeah. why? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. They, that, they got rid of that thing. It just became uh, different, and then she was quite disappointed. I mean, like, if, if it was still there, I'd be pushing the kids, being like, "It's mine, get off!" Like, <laughs> yeah. this part is quarantine. Do not touch. I have not touched it yet. You can yeah. do the other side, yeah. but these bones, leave it to me. Yeah. And even now, we have our entertainment. So it's like I go to cinema with her a lot. One is a new it's movie. A it's yeah. a tradition. Yeah, because uh, Roland is not a cinema person. No. <laughs> and uh, uh, it has like it, when we were in China, we did go all together for some, you know, the very big blockbuster like, Marvel yeah. the series, yeah. But then uh, it became, and then there was one some Star Wars, the the newer, you know, the other kind of no. stories came. I'm sorry, I have to say this now, and this will be posted after New Hope, the you know the first six movies, the good ones. Anything after that, crap. <laughs> the minute Disney got their paws into it, ruined. Yeah. So, so not that, my not my words, not <laughs> my words. So those are the things we do. We develop, and then uh, yeah, and then the the concerts. Like she, uh, I can't mm-hmm. remember how we got her into the classical music. I, maybe may have been Jenna Mary. No, no, actually, and, yeah. it was it was you because we went to one in China. Oh yes, yes. We, we I went to there and I was like. 13, 14, yeah. I'm at that age. My mother took me. In the orchestra. Yeah. yeah. I was like, hey, enjoy this. This yeah. is nice. So, so we, we start doing that together as well. Yeah. So we, we seek a lot of things to, to do together. And then also, I will say, oh, we need to go to the, the gallery, the new side of open. So she's, you know, she's very enjoying doing that. And then she also enjoys traveling with us. <laughs> yeah. And want to explore different parts of the world. So we seek common interests, but at the same time, she has her own interest, which I don't want anything to do with. Video games. Yeah. Well, the video game I can play occasionally, but, and then the video game and also watching some other kind of things, then, uh, the other two, they can do it together. And then it's she also. Star Wars fan. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, uh, she enjoys May cooking. The child be with <laughs> so, so all these, so this is like, like you said, rightfully said, playground is important. 
so you know it's like this environment again it inform it it develops this kind of uh relaxed equal ground communication uh you know dynamic and it builds so, skill as well you know i remember when i got my nintendo like the 3ds when we got like the marvel lego marvel games i sat next to the radiator in my own room three hours done all the levels completed. <laughs> and I was like, this is boring, huh? I've just finished everything. Because when I do something, if I really enjoy it, I can get it done in like four or three hours maximum. And then that's it. Now I'm like, okay, now what? What's next? <laughs> but it needs to, but there is, needs to be a balance between yeah. ev- between everything. Yeah. Yeah. Fun yeah. and serious. And that is something she's learning. Because that we just got her new PS5. Oh. So and that <clears> happened to be after her prelim with a bit of break and she has been quite playing a lot but then recently she started telling me oh I need to find the balance yeah. after playing this afternoon I will do that do that so she's very conscious of that and that is why without any interference yeah, yeah. we didn't we didn't force her or we didn't remind oh you know you don't play so many games not not more than how many hours no we never give her that kind of <laughs> specific rule it's like you decide again but how many how many children do not have this limit understanding or any kind of guidance on this. Actually, I think the reason why I want to find that balance is because I have a friend, he plays until like really late, like like 2 a.m. in the morning, and then he goes to bed. And then he's been telling me that he doesn't get enough sleep because he just plays games all day. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, like, how long, don't, why don't you just find the time to like study? Because he studies like after like a three hour, four hour game session, and then he continues. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so sorry. Go. And, yeah, then, so and, um, <laughs> and then he comes up in the morning and he's like so exhausted and he doesn't want to do anything because he's exhausted. And I'm like, I'm the same, right? But I'm not playing my game 24 7 every day of my life. I actually do other stuff. Like, I take a break to annoy my parents. It's my <laughs> daily activity. If I don't do it, there's something wrong with me. And then I actually do do my homework. Like, I have dissertations to write. I have to get them done in. I have to plan in my half right now, tomorrow, which I'll probably do when I get home. I'd tell tell me uh, the the homework and the dissertations and the stuff as you've been going through sort of formal education. Uh, are you enjoying it? No. <laughs> <laughs> are you enjoying the subject? I am because... Um, <laughs> For advanced hire, you get to pick what you want to do. Like after, like after National Five, you have more freedom in the subjects you want to choose, like what route you want to go into. And I, you know, stuck with like the social subjects. I took history, and I took history, RMPS, and modern studies. And I'm doing modern studies and RMPS for RMPS. So it's like religious, moral, and philosophical. Oh, and I enjoy doing that. And I'm doing my dissertations on that. I'm doing already doing my modern dissertation on uh, you know non custodial custodial sentences, and then which which one is you know the most effect, uh, effective in reducing reoffending amongst prisoners. And I'm you know doing my own information. And we went to a um we went to George Watson College on last Wednesday, and we were actually we were being spoken to by you know people from the actual justice system. And then people who have experienced justice systems, and then you're like understanding what is working, what's not working, what they need to change. And then, you know, like you really get good statistics out of it, and then being able to, you know, like write it down and, you know, be able to like translate that in your own view, like when you're what you're trying to do with the information, and then you're just like here, and then you're like citing quoting it. And it's like, I'm going to go cough. Yep, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like such an interesting study she's doing. Yeah. <laughs> she is, yeah. I think one of the things, um, first of all, she is interested in the topic. And uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, when she said she doesn't enjoy doing it, not really mean she doesn't like doing that. It's just this kind of, you know, certain <clears throat> contextual structures that she has to follow. Mm-hmm. And yes, you have the freedom of picking a topic, but you don't have the freedom of doing any topic you want to. It has to be, there is only a, a narrow selection. And the sometimes the selection is crap. Yeah. And, you know, because you don't have to fulfill the SQA requirement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, 
it, th- th- this is the dilemma that she has to face. But in a way, it is good to make her realize there's a certain restrictions. And then and she, there's a certain foundation you need to achieve before you can make a decision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So carry on. We were talking about dissertations and we still talking about it. <laughs> I enjoy doing them. I will not yeah. lie. I, I guess I, I'm really interested in w- what what your relationship to learning is. I do. I, what what about learning uh, entertains you? I I don't know. Um, I don't think I can actually explain that because when you ask me that question, I can't find an answer. I'm like, I just like doing it. There's no reason. Because it's, you know, I know like, maybe you can say like, you know, if I learn, if I know all these things, you know, I'm able to do more things and I'm able to have a better life. That's like basic knowledge, common sense kind of situation. But then when you realize, but when you get rid of the attitude that you have to do it, and you're just doing it because, you know, you actually want to. And then you're like, huh, oh, this is actually quite interesting because, you know, like, no, the world is not, no one's the same, right? Everybody has a different perspective. Everybody has a different view on things. And I find that interesting. And I like talking about it because, you know, like, I'm saying this now, I may be a bit more conservative compared to the rest of my classmates. But I am not, you know, denying them. And I'm not saying, no, no, you're wrong. I'm saying, like, I understand why you're saying this. Here's what I think. Here are the facts. You're wrong because of the facts, not because I'm saying it. So I always tend to, like, when it comes to social media, I always, like, I'm balanced. So I'm, like, on Instagram, I follow more, like, left-wing kind of stuff. You know, like the, you know, the activist kind of stuff, just to see what they're doing and see what they're going up to. And then on YouTube, I'm more like, you know, like Daily Wire kind of stuff. You know, Ben Shapiro, Brett Cooper, Candace Owens. I love Candace Owens. I'm saying this now, I love Candace Owens and you're seeing what they think and their common sense. And then when you watch it more and you compare it more, you realize, well, one side is lacking a sense of sense of you know like logic. Com- yeah, logic they're missing that because you know they're using more emotions and i understand your yeah, emotions is important but using your brain is like if you had to put like in a percentage 90 percent of it it's your brain and then that 10 percent is you know your emotions you know some people would say it's a 50 50 thing no for me the, pro- the problem is the facts don't care how you feel yeah. about them and I, th- I think that is that is something that is or has been increasingly lacking in formal education. Yeah. And what, what you said about uh, reward and punishment, oh, you, so are, you are rewarding expression of, this is how I feel about it. Yeah. So you are further enabling this kind of behavior and children see, well, if I express in this, uh, this thing in, in this uh, certain way, I get reward. Whether, whether it is recognition society-wise or a, a, a good grade at school, but the fact that you are talking about has not changed. So, uh, again, if you are not looking at at least two sides of the coin, then you are getting a very distorted picture yeah. of reality. And whether we like it or not, reality happens regardless of what we think about it. And we, we can't change the reality. I'm a very big fan of, you know, the story about King Canute. Uh, there's this story, uh, and it's sometimes mis, uh, misrepresented. So King Canute, uh, there's this story, but you know, he goes down to the, the shore of uh, the, the ocean and he, he tells the, the waves to go back. Mm. Uh, and uh, there's, there's an allegory he's trying to say to the people, look, I'm n- no matter what, I can change these facts. Yeah. You're maybe, you know, uh, and I, I think about that in terms of opinion. You know, I think Bishop Barclay, there was a the discussion about, well, yes, I'm going to kick this brick. The brick's still here, regardless of our conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that that yeah, I, I, it's it's 
I use the analogy of sun and rain. So no, it's uh, literally you you can when it's raining outside, it is raining. It's a fact. We can observe that. You can pretend, you can punish me for saying it's raining and, and pretending it's sunny. But if you go out, you get wet. <laughs> so the, the, these are the simple realities of life that we have to deal with. And to quote one of uh, her heroes, life, life is tough. tough. Get a helmet. Get a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was watching, it was actually Kenneth Owens who said that. I was watching it and then she went on this debate in one of the American campuses and then she was like debating with like, you know, at least um, woke, you know, people saying, oh, they stole this land from this person. And then Kenneth Owens is just like, no, it was actually on, you know, like, you no know, identity, like trans identity. And then it was so funny because Kenneth Owens was pregnant at the time, like ready to pop out kind of situation. And then she goes, I'm too pregnant for this, man. Life's tough. Get a helmet. Move on. It's so funny because she's like, she's not saying you're wrong. She's just saying, well, you look at the deal facts. With it. If you can't deal with it. Go somewhere else. Not anybody else's problem. So it's it's it's, it's again coming to this uh, to this discussion. If we if everybody is equally valid, yeah, then I can perform surgery on you. I can't guarantee that you survive, <laughs> but that result is equally valid to getting the best surgeon in the world in to save your life. And those two things are not equal. I, I, I am afraid, it's not only for personal reasons, these two approaches are not equal. I have a friend so. at school who has a communist sticker on her iPad. And I look at her in my head and I go, you know it doesn't work, right? There's plenty of evidence it doesn't work. Russia, China, is it working? No. But, and then there was the one time we were doing this in mentors in preventing violence training. And she came with a tote bag and it said, kids want communism. And I was like, no, we don't. No, <laughs> no. But the, 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 th the thing is, she has been in a country like that. Yeah. And she is starting to realize all the things that are or what, what she can't have there or what she would have there. And comparatively, I mean, quote, quote, again, quoting uh, um, this time a politician is, uh, yeah, socialism and communism worked so well. As soon as, as the borders fell, we, I have seen in which direction which people ran. So, and th that, that is just the thing. It, it is another extreme where you can see ult ultimately certain things just don't work. So, and I know I had, I had this debate with, with one of my supervisors and he said something very smart. The antidote for capitalism is not communism. It's a different form of capitalism. So, and very often we see, we see the world in a way that is not necessarily the actual reflection or not all the, all the options and opportunities that we have. Is that, that going back to like photo ideas, like how you take the photo, you know, like with the old device, you get the real picture, but if you take it from a different point of view, like with the digital camera, you get that distortion between what is actually reality right now. And I think it's up to the people to be able to find that kind of balance. For me, it's always about finding balance, you know, because what would Jen say? If the pendulum swings that way, it goes the other way. So finding balance is important for me. Well, this is very interesting. So I, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how, how, you, how you, how we collect and create critical spaces where maybe maybe there isn't agreement mm. but uh, we need we need these spaces to to compare to discuss yep. to analyze and you know find what that leads to what, what do you think about uh, constructive critical spaces I, I don't mind that I think it's important that we you know listen to everybody's ideas because we need you know to function as a society and you know, the idea of functionalism 
there are certain people within a society that we need in order to, you know, work. I learned that in modern, by the way. And, um, <laughs> and it's a very interesting theory. And in terms of, you know, having two people on two different sides, politically, whatever, being able to, you know, like, coexist, shall we say, is key because we can't be all, you know, critical or, you know, like, logical. Sometimes it doesn't work. Being logical doesn't always work. But being too emotional doesn't always work. So we need to find that, we need to find a system where logic needs to be placed, followed by emotion, rather than motion than logic, or lo just pure logic. I mean, like, you know, everything's two-sided, you know, like, two-faced, Batman, you know? <laughs> you know, the white knight of Gotham City, Harvey Dent, turns into crime mob boss two-faced. He's not a bad person. He's just a balance, even though he commits crimes. He is committing crimes to show the injustice in the justice system, shall we say. So he's a bad person showing the bad things in the good. You know, you need to be like Batman, you know, you need to be Batman in life. They are bad people, <laughs> but you need to be bad in order to be good, to do good. Yeah. I think like she just demonstrated how free she, how, how freedom is exercised in our household. Because I think like if in terms of creating this uh, constructive, cr critical, you know, ground, that actually starts from we are on the equal ground. So we never despise, we never undermine her op opinion whenever she has an opinion. We actually encourage her to express more. Yeah. But at the same time, we you shape also her. You probe. Yeah. You also probe and say, yeah, but what if? Yeah. And what will happen then? Yeah. And, and when you look at that. Yeah. And then we're also trying to discourage being too judgmental. Mm -hmm. So in other way, overly exercising one view and then completely dismiss the other. <clears> and I think <throat> th this is where um, it can, what I'm going to say can be easily taken in the wrong direction by many social justice warriors is I do acknowledge people are different. Yeah. Comes to the point that everybody has something they are good at and everybody has something that they are not good at. Also constrained by their life experience, the environment they grow up, and the resources they have available. And if they do not have a critical sounding board, that development is going in a, in a very specific yeah. and extreme direction. Yeah. So, so that kind of acknowledgement <clears throat> means, in a way, like I'm fully endorsed that education should be diverse. Mm. And I don't entirely agree that university education is the only best way for everybody. That is true. That's what I also say when I was doing this YMSB campaign. I, I said to them when I was talking about I'm, one of my factors is education. It's like, I'm not saying this is purely university. If you want to do something that is best suited for you, college, apprenticeships, whatever, we will there, be there to support you. It's your decision, our support, that kind of situation when I said to them. you need to know yourself. That, exactly. You need to know, you need to put in the right effort. And you need to know the, you need to know the facts. As, yeah. uh, picking up what, what Ping said about social justice. There is this, uh, it's, it's, it's a great uh, story, uh, study, has been criticized so, so many times, but the very critique of it undermines its own argument. So it's the Tierman study. And one of the results going further from, from this study is, is, uh, is a very recent thing. And to demonstrate that how racist the United States is, they brought up the fact that, well, the average American makes X amount of money a year. The average black American makes this and that amount less. In the same study, however, it was stated that the average Nigerian American is making a lot more money than the average American. So in in some in the most widely accepted circles, this was, oh, this is racist. My first question is, well, since when are Nigerian Americans not black Americans? And how come that this particular group of black Americans is not only surpassing their peer group as in terms of black Americans, but society as a whole? 
what are the factors, and it can't be race, when, when you see this, this, this kind of evidence, you have to dismiss race as a factor. Or if you still accept race as a factor, you need to say, okay, there is different factors that contributed to this. What are they? If you are jumping to a convenient conclusion because it supports your agenda, you are omitting a large portion of yeah, reality. Well, that's something I find interesting is when I'm looking at statistics from a dissertation and I'm looking at you know the reoffending rates, they have a specific section for you know colored people, you know, like black and American, Asian. And I'm like, why? Why do we need this? I'm looking at it as a whole. I don't need to be specific on what race is being, you know, put in prison more. I'm just looking at it generally. And I just find this weird that the Scottish government on the website they have is that the BAME people. And I'm like, I don't need to know this. This is irrelevant to me. You know, the white man is equally more likely to be in prison than the black man. Simple. It, every, I, I hate the it, idea of race. Is, is this true? I Well, obviously there are some circumstances, you know, one is, you know, more privileged than the other. But to me, it comes down to the individual. It's like, if you don't make the choice, if you don't make the effort, you're just part of, you know, you know the stereotypical, you know. It's funny because, you know, like, um, you know, like, you know, like basketball players, you know, the really famous ones, they're all black people. And they said, I put in the work to get out of that. Yes, there's, of there's, a good, there's a good example that uh, I actually saw um, a black NBA basketball player. It's, this was 1980. This is, this is an actual conversation this man had in the 19, in, in actual 1980. He said, the problem with blacks in the US today is the following. We have 1 million blacks that want to be an NBA player, yeah, but only 400,000 ever play at their high school level. Out of those 400,000, only so and so many thousand make it to college. Out of those at the college, only so and so many make it to the NBA. And only seven out of all these people will be in the starting line of their team. So we have one million black people competing for seven jobs. At the same time, and again, 1980, we have the need of so and so many thousands of programmers and we have a handful of black applicants. You brothers are competing for the wrong jobs. And looking at what are the factors that contribute to a certain outcome, race is what may be one ingredient. Then we have culture. Then we have, well, what is the family like? Again, I said society begins in the family. Mm -hmm. So the, quest, uh, the question, and this is now jumping forward to a former prisoner in the US who is going on all about uh, justice reform. And he says, the problem, one of the problems why more black people are incarcerated in the US is number one, the justice system in the US. It's got nothing to do with race. The problem is, what are the offenses? What is the punishment? And what kind of a police system do we have? We don't have a community police system. If we had a community police system, a lot of this nonsense would be gone. And also the American justice system is one of the justice system that benefits from an incarceration rate. Private prisons is just one example. So, and to, to pick up on that, um, Everybody knows that in the US, you have per capita the most or the highest imprisonment rate in the world. And do you know at which position the UK is ranked? I would, I, 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 I think it's fairly high up there. It is not competing with the US, but close to. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my question then is, if the justice system is producing this, this kind of outcome, what are the factors for that? And what are the factors that we need to, to look at? And as, as, as Alex said, my religion, my race, my gender doesn't matter for the choices that I make. Yeah. I, I may have only two bad choices 
but I can choose the least bad for me. Yeah, I think this is a little bit away from no, what we're supposed to talk about. <laughs> and I think to wrap up, to support my view, also linking the, the kind of evidence they provide, although they are in the States, the environment where individual grows can play a big part to what they are becoming later. So I think uh, the, the book written by a very prestigious African descendant economist, Tom Sowell, <laughs> he actually talks about, uh, well, they say black people are disadvantaged in education. When he's looking at the actual statistics, among blacks, those who grew up in more prestigious and economically active areas are much better in education, in opportunities and income, they, they, the type of job with high income, than those who grew up in not so uh, economically uh, prosperous states. So in another way, equally are black race. Because of the environment they grow up, the opportunities they were given and the resources they were made available, they have a different outcomes. And this has nothing to do with race. So, so from this perspective, I, I'm very much uh, in agreement that, yes, everybody has a different life path. And it is not always right. We give a lot of people who are in disadvantaged position a false hope, as in if you work harder, you can become someone else. Well, actually, life has taught us repeatedly, no, they can never become someone else. <coughs> They can, uh, they can only try to be better than what they were before or what their parents were before. But to completely transform where they are from or the kind of environment, the, the, the person that shaped by the environment they grew up, it takes a hell of effort. So in another way, no pain, no gain. So if, you, if someone really <laughs> wants to have that ambition, they really need to put in really substantial amount of effort to make that happen. Yes, it can happen. But if people who generally just want to follow a comfortable pathway, then it's not about educating them how to be Jordan, uh, you know, uh, Michael Jordan, how to be Einstein. No, it's how to be yourself to the, to the utmost. It's really like, you know, link back to the, the quote, I finished my ragged talk. You know, treat everybody, treat everybody what they ought to be, and then support them to become what they are capable of. Yeah. So, so this is actually what education, in my view, should be about, and then that is also what we have been uh, supporting her development is trying to identify her strengths and weaknesses, and that is why uh, we acknowledged we're not going to push her to do the math, knowing she's just not good at it, and. Uh, you know, with her later high school, she allows to choose the social science path and she's happily dealing with them. Well, probably for many other children, they find it very difficult to write essays, to have a debate like that. Well, she finds it comfortable. So that is what she's good at. But then we have other children we can witness. They are very good at mechanic, biology, math. And then, yes, go ahead, choosing those paths. But don't try to do something, you know. So, so in, instead of it's like, we have long ago realized we don't try to make her, we don't try to fill up her weaknesses. In other ways, to say, this is the area you're not doing well, or we should focus more on making it better. No, we should focus more on making what you're good at even better. So to utilize your strengths rather than trying to create a so-called balance. You know, this kind of balanced knowledge and skills or capability is compared to whom? And while at the same time, the behaviorism actually acknowledge everybody is a unique individual. Then when you're trying to create a, a shortage, like trying to fill up a shortage, that shortage usually is compared to others. Maybe a big proportion of others, but still you are trying to prepare your child to be one of them. The, 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 problem, the problem is you're comparing your weakness to somebody else's strength. Yeah. You, will all, you will always lose. There will always be someone who is better at something else. Yeah. So it's, again, it's come, it comes back to the needs and possibilities are limitless, but your ability and capability to fill it has certain limits. And 
Some people are just not maths people. Some, some people excel at it and become great uh, mathematicians, engineers, and so on. So, and society needs all of this. Yeah. <clears throat> don't ask me who it's fried on. <laughs> I, 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 I do detect there in, in your conversation, you've, you've uh, utilized mathematics to express <clears throat> another, a number of nuanced points. So it sounds like you're, you're, you're embodying a very tangled way of learning, of developing knowledge. I wish so. You're just putting your foot in everything. If you're not good at something, just close the door and focus on the other thing. Be an just... octopus. Eight, eight tentacles. Spread them out as wide as you can. If one gets chopped up, that's fine. You have seven left. Just, just in, in context of maths, <laughs> one thing I realized is... Perhaps the way we teach maths to young people is something that is inherently discouraging and making it look overly complicated. I mean, what, what kind of maths do you and I need on a daily basis? It's not high risk. Doing that so we, we, it's, uh, I, I don't want to contribute to the adage of, well, nobody ever asked me what X is. So there is, there is a certain application for a certain kind of math. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that I saw is in, in Alex, if the math is being contextualized, she can go much further with, with the numbers and, and things if, if she has a context to it. And, well, maybe perhaps we should teach maths more integrated into something practical. For example, Texas. well... You want, you want to bake 100 cupcakes. This is how much you need for one cupcake. How much do you need to buy? Yeah? If the, these ingredients cost this per 100, per 100 kilo, how much will, will uh, 20 cupcakes cost you? The, these, these are things that somebody, depending on the context, obviously, you can, you can extend that to any kind of, uh, of practical mathematical problem. Yeah? So... Okay, well, I'm, in, I'm interested in, well, when can I buy the sports car? How, how much will these cupcakes cost? Or what, whatever the application is. How many bowls of rice can you eat in one sitting without throwing out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A puzzle to us all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I know this is not relevant, but it's funny, very interesting. This man died from drinking like 10 bottles of like compressed mm -hmm. carrot juice and someone at the bottom was like so the limit is nine <laughs> <laughs> i found that really funny i was just like the limit is nine i'm very interested to hear from all three of your perspectives on what what behaviors make for a happy family that is yeah well <laughs> I think I have to I have to claim You don't before, all have to agree. <laughs> yeah, I have to claim before we share our view I I do not want to generalize what we offer because yeah. this is based on our experience and then each of us has a unique life experience to grow up and never uh, never mentioned the cross culture perspective. But I think overall if we rather than saying the behaviors I would say some um traits that can attribute to this kind of thing. First of all, is the sense of honoring the honesty. And then that, in a way, is parents and children do not lie to each other. This even includes, like, I'm not very much uh, the fan of some parents deliberately admitting children when they are talking about something disheartening or bad. They feel, oh, it's good to protect the young people, mm. don't let them experience this. Well, actually, I don't think that is the case. That, that, that is overprotecting our leading to a vulnerable individual when they grow up because they don't experience that. And the other thing is also the genuine love is the kind of, you know, you have to truly love each other to, to feel we want to be, make other person better. And how can we do it better? Then we will look for it. And the third thing is having this, well, uh, I, I can't say it's probably, maybe it's the sense of um, equality in terms of the position that family. Well, there's no such thing that I'm the parents do what I, do what I tell you. Oh, I'm the kid 
I don't know anything. I don't do. I can't do many things. So you have to do it for me. So do not take privilege of this, you know, kind of natural position in the relationship. And the, the next thing is also, which which applies to anybody, continuous learning, <laughs> learning to discover and learning to accept and reflect thinking. Yeah. So so I would say probably these are the very Foundational traits that will you know not only well you know this is not just for the the basic parenting <coughs> relationship it's actually for everybody you know won't go much wrong if they just apply those traits into shaping their behaviors or being conscious and being attentive to things and uh, oh yeah probably another thing is like being open as in openly accepting. Openly communicating. I love gossiping with my mother. I always tell her what happens. <laughs> yeah. So, so that is probably what I would say that made our relationship quite healthy, at least in our term. And uh, you know, uh, we are very happy about each other, and then we appreciate each other, and we openly express our love and affection to each other. And there's no, you know, any sense of, uh, you know. Rejecting, or you know, definitely, uh, even some in some disagreement, we can work out among ourselves and coming to a mutual, mutually accepted and mutually respected decisions. If I want to add words, it's humility, knowing yourself, and as as being said, there will always be disagreements. There's uh, two two people, two opinions. And if we can't create the environment where two opinions can coexist, how how can we include a third person in, in this in this term, Alex? The other thing I want to say, well, what what is happiness? So happiness may be something different for us three than what it is for the next family. So um, I. I am always reluctant to give life, life advice in the form of, or oh, you should do this or that. So in, in, in a, again, in a totally different context is uh, one of the first conversations I had on my job is, I am totally desperate, said, uh, said a student. I, I come here, I'm from totally different culture and I really don't know what, what am I doing? What can I do with this? And I mean, how do you answer that? As, as the very first conversation you have in, in student support. So I said, well, that's a good question. What do you want to do? And giving people the space to know themselves. And in this, in this relationship, it has taught me also, well, what am I good at? What am I not so good at? Yeah. Where do I take the lead? Where do I play the follower? And it goes back to if we, if both parents give 100% for their relationship, the, if you want to say fallout or byproduct is that the child is being raised in a family where the child sees, well, this is a conducive environment for me to be myself. Well, who am I? What do I want to do? How do I relate to? this parent, that parent, the grandparents, society as a whole. So I think happiness is a term that every individual would define for themselves. And any form of advice can only be very, very generic. It's not really looking for advice. I, I guess what, what I'm very interested in doing is getting seeking ways for me to reflect on what traits, what aspects and characteristics make for good relationships. You know, what, what's a healthy relationship? This, this is thinking, actually one of them. This is actually yeah, one of yeah, one of yeah. them looking at, okay, how do things work somewhere else? Or is it, you, you can you can go beyond relationships. And you can you can look at any kind of phenomenon or idea and say, okay, 
How does this person do it? How does that person do it? Draw the best things from everywhere and say, okay, how can I put this together for myself? Please, your addition. <laughs> mm. I don't know, I'm thinking of food right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think it's just common sense. I don't know if that I don't know if that helps, but I to me, yeah. everything <laughs> is just common sense. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If it's right, it's right. And then for me, it's um, you know, it's being to you know, like you said, it's like being able to express myself like in an environment where I will not be like ridiculed or something like that. It's more about um. Finding something that three people or more people can do together is like that one singular factor. Like, um, for me and Baba, it's like annoying Mama. <laughs> and it's when it's us, when it's me and Mama, it's like watching movies together because I enjoy doing that. And then it's about like talking about it. And then I would hope we are not only annoying your mother, <laughs> but it's more fun. I think uh, probably rather than saying honesty, I just realized the words better replacing honesty is the authenticity. I want to the openness. The openness I also mentioned. Yeah. And the other thing is also reflecting what you mentioned about this cooperative development. I think it's the sense of collaboration. So relationship is not one proof to be right, the other is wrong. It is how do we create a mutually acceptable common ground or common space that everybody can enjoy for being themselves rather than only enjoy when they have to be someone else. And if really, you know, like I said, happiness is no standardized form. Anybody can, can seek happiness in their own way. But I think overall, if we say a kind of feeling that can describe a commonly accepted happiness is, is we intrinsically feel resilient and peaceful forever. Even in some turbulent time, you know, even in the downs of our life, is we seek the intrinsic peace inside and uh, have enough trust of ourselves and also the people in the very close relationship who will always be with us and supporting us. And if that is the kind of status established in any family relationship, then anything can be easily achieved, no matter what that goal is. But providing, because normally that will indicate the dream or the, the goal will always be realistic and authentic rather than ideal and, uh, you know, grand, but not achievable. So this kind of achievable will always be honored in, if a relationship is really developed under these trees, I would say largely that will inform what a healthy parent-children relationship should look like. Thank you. Uh, to, to give you a sense of where these questions are coming from, I started out with this perspective of thinking, trying to think through it, what education is, what learning is, what how it's structured. And I, my, my perspective started from looking from outside in and going, oh, all these buildings make a university. And my journey has been to go, it's not the buildings, it's not the tools, it's the people and how people yeah. are relating to each other, how people are communicating. And, and reading things like, um, so Marcus Aurelius wrote his meditations. And, and what really touched me most powerfully about that whole book was he starts out with these beautiful stories about people in his life that he cares about. He, he, these are little, little vignettes of, oh, well, this person I learned this from. And, uh, it, and I could just imagine those relationships in the world. And that helped me start to to really redirect my attentions away from this material externality yeah. Yeah. towards... Very interesting point yeah. you're making is, uh, I was, 
I'm ju I'm just completing or I've just completed an essay about uh, uh, ba basically use of electronics and technology in education, and part of my conclusion was is well maybe the means to transfer knowledge are changing, but the more these change, the more we technify education, the more we should go back to what is education actually about. It's not a fancy PowerPoint or a, a, vid a video lecture and whatever. It is the transfer of factual knowledge and enabling people to ponder and think about this piece of knowledge and to turn it into something positive, not only for them. I think again that links quite nicely to the ragged talk I did. You know what is innovation in a higher education? Is that introducing the technology? Is that innovation? <laughs> While the materials are still many years old, and then not, you know uh, teaching faculty are still incompetent in explaining theories and concepts clearly to students and relating to the current facts or the current reality. So yeah, so that is really uh, I think uh, when you say remove all the material context. That also includes remove the instrumental differences of humans, whether race, gender, age, size, <laughs> or you know your 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 kind of uh, the <laughs> size. Yeah, well, I, fortunately, that is one of the factors. So anything those like really focusing on the the superficial level, you remove them. You look at the inner. So when we look at the inner. There, there's no difference. It's just a pile of thought and how we organize the thought and how we uh, disseminate our thought to make to, to into the world and creating the, the reality that is originated in our surroundings. But this originated reality will not influence the distance reality of another culture, another society. And, and, and that is why the contexts are always there to create different standard grounds. So, so this is where uh, we say the ethical side of things are more fundamental and generic. Because when we talk about morality, that comes from different societies, different cultures, different religions, influence. And one society's morality cannot speak for another. Mm -hmm. And more so, we cannot use our morality to judge us others' uh, action and behavior and coming to a, a conclusion as in they are good or bad or they shouldn't happen. It is all down to the ethical question. Is, is that fundamentally right or wrong to have such behavior despite it is a rule of thumb or it is a social norm in a certain area? So it's just like, you know, do we want to see who the elephant, what the elephant really looks like or do we only want to see one area, one area of that elephant uh, is and then going to jump in the conclusion. Because when there are not enough facts, they are, the, the, the gap will be filled by subjective views, mm -hmm. and which will more and more take the space of the actual reality and the facts. That's why I enjoy RMPS so much, because I get to you know, look at different religions and how they deal with you know, ethical issues like, you know, like abortion or euthanasia. And actually, it's very interesting. And then I always think that... Um, you know, being aware of, you know, like religion, because religion is a very big factor, you know, like in society, because society was built on from religion, religion built society. And I think it's important to see that, you know, why, you know, the Bible says this and how we can, I like reading the Bible. I'm just going to say this right now. Actually, reading the Bible is very interesting. You learn a lot about, you know, Christianity and Catholics and Muslims, and you see how they all have one fundamental principle among all of them, but how they, you know, achieve that is different. It's the same purpose. You know, even we can say all religions are the same, you know, the basic, you know, being kind, being good, you know, making sure other people, they're all the same. It's just how different religions reach that potential is different, you know. Well, uh, Christians are more, you know, compassionate, you know, in terms of like organ donation that they see as an act of compassion. But, you know, Roman Catholic think, well, if you do that, you're not really looking, being compassionate to yourself, you know, the idea of sanctity of life, how life is valuable. That's being compassionate to you, but also to others, and that life is valuable. 
And, you know, in Islam, you know, stewardship is all about making sure that, you know, God's creation is protected, cared for. And this is everything, you know, humans, life, the planet. And I always think it's very interesting. And I always, when people say that religion is just like a cult, I'm like, it's it's not a cult. Some, some things are like a cult. But if you understand the basic values, you see how important it is and how, you know, it influences society and how people grow. That's why religion, people need to learn about religion. Like, at least read on it. Like, <laughs> go speak to a priest or something like that. Like, knowing different <clears throat> views can, you know, build on you. For me, like, when I started looking at religion more, I started, you know, being my, you know, influencing my decisions on, you know, like what the Bible says, you know, what the religious people says about like caring. When it comes in terms of people, looking at the Bible is probably the good thing, you know, how in the Bible it says love thy neighbor or turn the other cheek if someone slaps you. Or my favorite one is if someone slapped you on your cheek, turn to the other side so they can slap the other cheek. I find that funny. And my RMPS teacher is just one of the most wonderful people in the entire world because she's also a nurse. How lovely to hear that. Yeah. And um, she, yeah. um, when we're doing medical ethics, she's like, she is giving her own experiences about being a nurse and being, what was like being a, a working intensive care unit and having to make these decisions about, okay, this child, this person has died and they have perfectly good organs to save other people. But the idea of how do we ask them because we just can't say, yeah, your kid's dead. Can we have their organs, please? We'll just sign here. We'll just snatch them. And you know, when it's like protecting people's life even after they're dead. And then I think religion plays, you know, a big... I'm rambling. I'm so, I oh, really, right. I like, this like, is a place to be rambling. I'm like always... I never realized when you're talking about something... I'm very like, rich ecumenical perspective. When I'm rambling, I feel like... I see so many connections. I'm like, oh, ding, 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 ding. Like 50, like 50 light bulbs pop up to my head. And I'm like, you know, it's like, you know, you know, like there's like that Spider-Man meme where it's like two Spider-Mans go to each other and they go, they're just pointing at each other going, like, wait a minute. <laughs> I love memes. I like making memes. So, uh, it, uh, so, so much of the richness, the fun of life for me is being in situations like this of getting to hear other people's thoughts and, and cascades of thoughts and call, uh, getting these multiple light bulbs all yeah. going off at once. And yeah. going, after I learned RMPS, <laughs> the minute when I did my higher RMPS, after that, the switch just like, something in my brain just switched on and I can just like see everything. And like my eyes have been open to the world. I can, I know everything. And I'm like, when we're learning about, um, you know, like deterrence, retribution, and protection, after we learn that in movies, I can spot everyone. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's this? Hold on, this is something like that. And it's like, and when you learn something like modern studies, you're able to put that together. And then if you take learn history, you're also able to put that together. And then when you do philosophy, it's like a nice cake with an icing on top. That's how I feel. I feel like when I'm like learning about new things that you can able to make that connections. And I think being able to make those connections in life is very important because that's how you, you know, progress in the world and, you know, give world peace, even though we'll never reach that. That's just a fundamental fact. You, you will never imagine 12 years ago, she was so quiet at home. <laughs> now it's like we have to try to turn her off at times. <laughs> some, some people may, I got um, asked by this kid, it's not relevant, he came up to me and was like, do you have autism? <laughs> and he came up to me <clears throat> and he asked me, he was like, do you have autism? And I was like, no, I'm just smart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, super. I, I, yeah, yeah the, the, uh, the, the joie de vivre, the, the enjoyment, the we have in asking questions and finding out more stuff and more stuff. Uh, I'm always a little worried when that disappears from view. So, you, you know, you, I'm hearing you be polymathic, you know, interested in all knowledge uh, and, and 
attending to it all and I'm not not going oh well I'm I I only think about this part of yeah. human experience it's like, it's like back to the octopus be like an octopus eight legs spread them out as wide as you can no too wide <laughs> this is actually uh, you know the scientific evidence actually says IQ scores of the same person can be different at their different life stage depending on the experience they have so you know, it it would be ideally is the more learning one has, the higher the IQ scores go, but there are situations it is the other way around, because children have naturally the naivety of being curious around their surroundings, but then because of the life experience, the family influence or the you know the social environment, and even the peer pressure they can become less and less interested in things and become less and less curious. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, their learning journey naturally becomes duller and singular. And that score of the IQ will reflect from higher at the early age to lower at the adulthood. But if mm -hmm. this curiosity can be neutered over the time by communicating and by constant support and stimulating, then the, the IQ score will go up. So I think if I were to describe her development, I can comfortably say, or very confidently say, her IQ points at the early age, probably not as high, or definitely not as high as she is now. Yeah. I'm not doing a test. <laughs> <laughs> so. I fear the results. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, this, uh, this really makes me think about, uh, are, you, are you aware that institutions in Scotland, in the UK, have been called corporate parents? And, and I'm quite interested, in, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting, I, I came to this through John Morrison's work, his, his teachings, uh, really interesting. And he was looking at this statutory law, uh, and it's it's quite powerful in when I then look at an institution and I I ask what kind of parent is this, what kind of relationships is it cultivating, what kind of recognitions and non-recognitions are going on. Yeah. Well, I think it, it does make sense if you consider people working in these institutions and schools are parents at some stage. Indeed, and then yeah. naturally, how we perceive the world, how we perceive, well, what our value will always be translated into how we approach the work. And in the education sector, particularly how we educate and <laughs> engage our students. Oh dear! Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, this this is a totally different context, and um, but 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 it's so it's actually so spot on what you're saying about uh, you you can't stop being a parent or you, you can't yeah. stop being a social animal. And I I fear when I when I taught or when I engage with students now, I very often get the feeling that. If nobody comes to the rescue of this person, they are going to throw away their life. Because there is a lack of knowledge, there's a lack of foundation, there's zero ambition. And all I can see behind what is what is being said is I demand, I get. And Nobody is ever asking the question why. I, th I think that's that's an art that we have lost. Asking questions, and in in practical terms, I, I see I see this very often. I get I get asked questions, for example, by by my students. I'm saying it in this letter. I'm saying it in this newsletter. It is in this 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 and this document that you should be reading even before you have the problem. And this lack of self-responsibility in individuals, it's for me as an educator, 
and for for me as for me as a parent it is so hard to hold my tongue hold my horses not start screaming and shouting because i i can see the train crash coming you you know it is going to come and even if you are successful for the next four or five years or whatever the fact that there is no and or not the right foundation not the right question to the wrong answer is something as you don't want as a parent or as an educator you don't want that person in four or five years to hit a wall not even knowing well why is this happening what can i do to avoid this and you already see this person is going to hit the wall again and again hoping for a different outcome so i think that is the hardest part for me as as an educator and parent to say there is a point where you need to stop and you need to accept the outcome no matter what it is because you can continue to invest yourself into an equation where the outcome is already determined so and that's that's not to say that have, having having this outcome doesn't finally trigger something but based on what so i mean for for her it was for me was the frustration months yeah <laughs> and i now i now see there is so many other things and yes she can do maths she just doesn't like it <laughs> and there's so many other things that she is doing instead where she has a foundation that if she uses it and the fact that whether she uses it or not is not up to me is something that is also at the end of it creating some sort of peace because you know there are certain things you can't influence it is it is something that every single individual needs to make a choice for themselves <laughs> or peppers i hate them and no matter how many how many dishes i will just eat. say turkey <laughs> and This is this is the perfect example for you not not eating this or not doing that. There will be a day <laughs> where you do it. <laughs> it may not be this day, day. <laughs> but there is so many things in my life where I said I'm never going to do that. Yeah, that's true. And here we are. <laughs> I also think that um, individuals need you know a good family value, you know, being able to. Like for me, when when I'm looking for like someone to settle my life down with, it's always to have that good strong family value. Because if you don't have that good strong family value, how can you, you know, I don't know, like how can you develop a new family? <laughs> yeah, it's like your family influences you, and then you and you learn a lot from your family. I always I always say this to my to when I'm talking to people. It's like my mother, my dad. My grandparents, well, they always influenced me, and I love them very much. And I, I always say to them that to me, what one of my goals is to have my own family of my own, you know, because I would like to, you know, see what I have learned being passed down to the next generation, and making sure that they are, you know, happy and stable and in within the family environment. Because in the attachment theory. Also by Morden, it says that um, there's a critical period if a child does not attach, create this attachment with their parents, it can lead to you know bad social skills, can lead to you know mm -hmm. psychopath, yeah, yeah, really like antisocial behavior. And when I see that and I go and I see it, you know, like in other people, I realize there is in students there is not that kind of strong family value. Because when I talk about my family, like, oh, we don't do that. I was like, why not? This is basic one, two, three kind of values in life. So, but it's unpack, a different world. Unpack that phrase so, for me. Family values. I can see that you've, you've got a very clear idea. I, For me, is I have this friend. And 
or we talk and then I talk about my family with her and then she talks about my her family with her and one thing I found very interesting is that she doesn't have dinner with her parents or uh, in another case you know like in Kai who was my other friend he doesn't have that kind of strong bond or that kind of family value like he is not kind of you know kind of aware of like his family kind of interactions because when I went to his house I found out that he calls his parents by their first name and I'm like <coughs> that is really strange for me because I've always called them you know mama baba birth giver <laughs> the enabler <laughs> you know this financial drain <laughs> yes yeah, yeah, and I see it's like when they're around each other, it's not as, you know, knitted, like close knitted. It's like they don't have that common interaction between them, like how I have with my parents. It's like, to me, it's just a general thing. And because uh, <coughs> there's, there's one case <coughs> that, um, that happened not too long ago was I was at his house and his parents were ready to leave. What I do with my parents is when they're leaving is I stand there and watch them leave you know, to make sure they have everything because <laughs> forgetful, also forgetful. <laughs> and it's just my way of, you know, caring for them, that kind of caring nature between all of us. And he doesn't do that. When they leave, they just say bye and they're just doing their other things. So when I was there, I specifically stood on the stairs watching them get ready and then when his mother was like <coughs> do I have everything I was like phone keys cards because I do it with them <laughs> and then my friend turned to me like what are you doing and I was like I don't know this is what I do with my family to me it's very normal it's like an intuition kind of thing mm. it's like being wanting to care for someone that you love because for me it's like if one person cares for me and I want to reciprocate that kind of feeling I enjoy doing that, and it makes me feel happy and warm and safe. Ooh. But for them, <laughs> it's just like everything. I feel like everything's like one sided, and when it comes to sorry, hold on. When it comes to like talking about issues they have, he tells me that he doesn't talk to his parents about the issues he's having. And when it comes to me, like if I have an issue. I'll just say it out loud and then ask for opinions or I just go out to them and ask for hugs. He doesn't do that, nor does his brother. And I'm like, this is basic family stuff. And you're not having this concerns me about how your you know, well, well-being when you grow up. Because when you leave the nest, so to speak, you in a way, you still rely on your parents to like, support you, whether that's financially or uh, mentally. Because... Having that bond with your parents, you're able to, you know, progress more. And if you don't have a good family value, when it comes to you eventually having a child, if you don't have that good bond with your child, that child's going to be, pardon my French, fucked up. <laughs> pardon my <laughs> French. It, 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 it gets downhill, Yeah. So let, let, let's just say, if, 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 I, if I teach you everything I know, and you get about 80% of that, then you teach someone else what you understood, those 80%, and that person understands 80% of that. So if, if there is no connection like that, then there is automatically always a gap to the next, to the next generation instead of an improvement. So whether whether it is it is in education or in family, it's the same thing. When 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 I talk about oh, let me finish this. When I talk about my family with my friends, they're very surprised of you know how close we are, and then also other people like when we meet new people, they say, "Oh, you're very close to each other," and it's like, "How do you do that?" And I go, "Well, I can't explain it. I can't really define the word family value because to me." I just know what I'm doing because I, I observe and I reproduce and not reproduce. Reciprocate. Reciprocate. Yeah. <laughs> reciprocate. And then it just comes to me naturally. That kind of thing. I think that's like kind of that natural instinct 
A, a really joyful moment was that the, the, the ragged talk that you gave me and uh, discussing, and I was saying this to because I'm working with uh, uh, educators at the University of Manchester who are thinking about technology and AI and education. And I was just saying, oh, yeah, yeah, it was it was lovely to have, to see a whole family come along. And, and Alex, the daughter, uh, they, you know, gave this amazing perspective. And the whole, whole, whole room got so much out of, of what you were uh, sharing. But it's not uncommon that I've seen... Oh, well, it, it, it is uncommon that I've seen a family learning together and and participate in a year. There, there's obviously a, a, a playful dynamic you've all got. And I, I really appreciate that. So that that's indeed why this this conversation, recording conversation with you, just oh yeah, well, like to like to know more about how you're relating and nurturing each other. I would say like if you put like in a in a mic in our house and just listen listen to the conversations we have, it's not your typical you know average family because when you compare that to you know like say kids from my school. That family dynamic is not there, but when it comes to us, it's like it's very obvious. It's even if you say there is a different, uh, is a different dynamic, it's the kind of underlying purpose and foundation where where it is coming from, and I I can really see the purpose of all of us is well we want we want to make this thing work. We also have been going through bad experiences together. Mm -hmm. But when I and lost my video game, it was so sad. I got killed three times. I'm talking about more serious things. <laughs> but the, the, thi the, thi the thing is, if you do not have this common purpose, any organization, any social structure, whether it's a family, an organization, or even society, starts falling apart. So as, as, as Alex said, if everybody just goes in... A different direction or not seeing each other off when, when you when you leave the house this is something now that we now, now that we mentioned it is I go out of the house somebody if somebody is home they will come out say goodbye it's when, when Bing goes to work or when I go to work the other one comes and says goodbye yeah and this is just this idea of Having this situation, I understand why you're going. I don't want you to go. So I at least want to give, give you a seeing off on that journey where you go. It is fundamentally a very different thing of I'm leaving. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think really down to that one word, <coughs> the cooperative or collaborative. Yeah, it's just having mutually accepted common ground, but at the same time allowing differences. So it is a sense of inclusion. Yeah. So the, the true value of being inclusive to you know accept we are different, but at the same time we can work together to achieve a common goal. So that is what family should be about. In turn, this behavior will be fed into the society. So the citizens of the community will behave similarly and influence more people. And that is where the positive cycle can happen rather than the downhill, you know, kind of the, the vicious circle. Mm -hmm. So so I think that, that would be really, you know... Maintenance makes... takes effort. Yep. Down, downhill doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for this. It's a really, really uh, fantastic journey. You've given me a whole curriculum for me to study oh. so thank you we're happy to participate in that as well <laughs>